One more time, just thank our worship team and our choir just for leading us. What a gift. What a wonderful gift. If you're new to our congregation, my name is Rich. I'm the lead pastor at New Life Fellowship Church. And if this is your first time here, I'm absolutely thrilled that you're with us. And if you're from out of town and you're, you're with us, thank you for, for worshiping uh, with us. I want to I greet those folks who are downstairs as well, watching from our Blue Room. Um, thanks for making the trip to, to be with us here this evening. Throughout the course of the last few weeks, we've been focusing on a series through the Gospel of John. And what I want to do tonight is offer a short word of reflection. We were focusing on John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1 through verse 14. And for the last few weeks, we've been focusing on verses 1 through 13, focusing on Jesus as the light of the world, and that we are waiting for the coming light. And today I want to focus on verse 14, and I want to use this as my point of reflection, and I want to break this verse down. In John chapter 1, in verse 14, it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the passage I want to look at today. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Let's ask the Lord to open our eyes, our ears, our hearts as we look to his word, and then we'll close our time together with a wonderful candle lighting portion of our service. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace, your love, your mercy towards us. And Lord, on this Christmas Eve, we ask that the Holy Spirit now would open our ears, our eyes, and our hearts to receive every gift of revelation that you have for us this evening. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Last week in South Wales, in the UK, there was a Banksy sighting. For those of you unfamiliar with the name Banksy, Banksy is a world-renowned anonymous artist who shows up in different parts of the world and vandalizes, I mean creates, um, <laughs> beautiful pieces of art, often political art in public spaces. His work is sometimes sold for millions of dollars, and so when his last piece of work showed up on a garage uh, wall, people were overwhelmed that Banksy had visited them. His most recent work is called Seasons Greetings. We're on one side of the garage, there's a, a dumpster fire, and on the other there's a little boy who seems to be receiving snowflakes, and it's a whole message that he's trying to communicate, but what I found particularly interesting in light of the Christmas season was how fascinated and how humbled and how honored people were that Banksy came to their little town, that he showed up in, his, in their little town. And as I thought about Banksy and the, uh, the joy that people had, that this artist came to their town, I thought about Christmas. But there's an interesting and important difference to note. Banksy comes to a city in different towns around the world and remains anonymous. Christmas, or Christmas reminds us that God comes into the world for the sake of revealing himself. In some respect, up until this point in the scriptures, God's identity was somewhat hidden. No one ever got a look at as to who God truly was. But Christmas changes all of that because God has come to be seen to be seen in the flesh. And this is the Christmas message. God moves close to us. How close? John 1.14 says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. When we think about the Christmas story and the ways we hear it and the ways we tell it, we often begin the Christmas story in time. We begin with Israel. We begin with angels, we begin with Mary, we begin with Joseph, we begin with shepherds. That's how we typically begin the Christmas 
story. And this is how Matthew begins the story. This is how Luke begins the story. In the gospel of Matthew, at the very beginning of his gospel, he speaks of Jesus's human family of origin. He tells of how Jesus's life began, his human life began. But John, the gospel writer, where we're focusing our text on today, he does something different when he begins his gospel. He does something actually opposite. Because instead of speaking of Jesus' human family of origin, John speaks of the human family's origin in Jesus. He flips the script. He lets them know that Jesus is more than just a man. He's more than just a carpenter. He's more than just a rabbi. He's more than just a healer. He's more than just a teacher. This human being who's come into the world is none other than God. God of God, light of light. And so John says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. John, at the very beginning of this gospel, offers some very majestic, eternal language. He offers cosmological, metaphysical, supernatural language to speak about the coming of God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. At this point, he says, the word was the light of the world, and the darkness has not overcome the light over and over. He's talking about the power of this word who becomes light that the darkness cannot handle. But then he gets to verse 14 and staggers the human mind. He says, this word didn't just become light. This word became flesh and dwelt among us. What I want to do for this reflection is to break this verse down in three ways. I want to focus on the word became flesh and dwelt among us. I want to focus on those three aspects of this verse. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. First of all, the word. Jesus is said to be the word of God. And when you see this word in the Greek language, it's the word logos. It's the word where we get logic from. Jesus is the logic of God. This is a word that's taken from Greek philosophy. But to make it a little bit more pedestrian, to make it a little bit more plain, to say that Jesus is the word of God is to say that he is the clearest revelation of who God is. Because a person's word is the clearest revelation of who they are. Here's a trivial way of saying it. Let's say you study someone, you're observing someone, you're trying to make inferences and conclusions about someone, and let's say you see someone drinking tea one day and then coffee the next day, and this person says, I'm coming over your home, we're going to have a meal together, and so you're confused, should I bring out the coffee or should I bring out the tea? But you want to get a definitive answer, and so what do you do? You ask her, what do you like, coffee? Or tea. I've observed you. What, 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 what do you like? And the person might say, well, from time to time I drink coffee, but I really like tea. Now you know. She spoke a word. And the word became a clear revelation of who she is. This is what John is saying. Jesus Christ is the clearest revelation of who God is. When, the, when God wanted to let the world know who he was, he sends a word. He speaks a word, and the word spoken is Jesus Christ. John says he is the word of God, saying, if you want to know who God is, God has clearly spoken his word in Jesus Christ. You can know aspects about who God is. You can look at creation and see who God is. But if you want to know definitively who God is, he is the word. Jesus is the word of God. And so John says, the word, and then he says something staggering. He says, became flesh. The word becomes flesh. I love that the word didn't become a religious system. The word didn't become a theological checklist. The word didn't become a political movement. The word didn't become a subjective spiritual experience. The word becomes flesh. The word didn't become a religious system. It's actually the case that when Jesus Christ came into the world in his birth and his death and his resurrection, 
Jesus marks the end of religion as we know it. I heard Tim Keller, pastor in Manhattan, tell the story of another pastor named Dick Lucas. And in a sermon that Dick Lucas once preached, he recounted an imaginary conversation between someone from Rome and an early Christian soon after the resurrection. And this Roman neighbor says, ah, I hear you are religious. Great. Religion is a good thing. Where is your temple or holy place? And the Christian responded, we don't have a temple. Jesus is our temple. No temple, but where do your priests work and do their ritual? We don't have priests to mediate the presence of God. Jesus is our priest. No priest, but where do you offer sacrifices to curry favor with your God? Well, there's no need to make a sacrifice. Jesus is our sacrifice. And the Roman man says, what kind of religion is this? And the lady says, it's no religion at all. It's, it's good news. It's the gospel. The word didn't become a theological checklist. That you can get everything right theologically and still be lost. The word didn't become a political movement. Where you can join whatever movement in the world but not get it confused. These movements do not speak for God definitively. The word did not become an aesthetic experience. The word became flesh. Why does God become flesh? Well, it wasn't because God was lonely. It was because God was loving. God reaches toward us. God demonstrates his love. And God became flesh to demonstrate very clearly who God was in the deepest part of God's character. Because Jesus comes in a vulnerable way, demonstrating the self-giving love of God. He comes in vulnerability. I love that Jesus doesn't come in, in, a, in a kind of science fiction kind of movie as a grown adult. You know, God could have done anything. He, Jesus could have come on the scene as a 30-year-old, 33-year-old man and started teaching the masses, but he doesn't come as an adult, he comes in great vulnerability as an infant. He comes to show us the vulnerable side of God. It's a paradox. The defender of the weak becomes weak and defenseless. The one who covers all becomes naked and exposed. The one who cares for all now is in need of great care. The one who holds it all together as a baby needs to be held tightly. Jesus shows us what God is like. He knows what it's like to experience the full human experience. And so you've been rejected. Jesus knows what it's like to be rejected. You've suffered. Jesus Christ knows what it's like to suffer. You've been abandoned. Jesus knows what it's like to be abandoned. You've been broke. Jesus knows what it means to be broke. And so he knows everything about human experience. The invitation for every one of you in this room is come to him. He knows your story. He knows your pain. He knows your anxiety. He knows your suffering. He's experienced it firsthand himself. God did not stay way up here. God came way down here. He knows everything we've experienced. So come to him. Draw near to him. The word became flesh. And then thirdly, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, when John uses this word to dwell, he's not talking about, he could have used any general language, any general word for dwell. There are many different words he could have used. But John uses an important word of, of, of dwelling, and John recognizes that you can be in a similar space but not truly dwell with another person. I think about apartment city life. In one square block in Queens, thousands of people can dwell among each other, and even though we might be close, we're not dwelling together. When we stay at a hotel, hundreds of people in a hotel in a given night, but we're not dwelling together. We're not moving close to each other. But when God comes on the scene, he doesn't just come to hang around. He comes to dwell, to move close 
to us. The literal word for that is the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. It's a good Old Testament phrase of Jesus being the very presence of God. Christmas reveals a God who, does, who just doesn't live in the neighborhood. Anonymous, he comes to dwell among us. God wants to be close to you. He wants to dwell with you. He wants to live in you. And this is the fundamental difference between religion and the gospel. The religion says, and religion in a, in generally speaking says, we have to do all we can to get to God. That our good deeds outweigh our bad deeds. That we go to church, that we do a whole, we have to do all these things to get to God. Christmas says there's nothing we could do to get to God. But here's the good news. God has come to us. God has come to us. One of the more iconic pictures to describe this is an image, a painting of Michelangelo. And I've used this a, a few years ago, and it bears just repeating for Christmas. In the Sistine Chapel, there's uh, Michelangelo's famous depiction of God and Adam. And when you look at this picture, what you see is a really wonderful theological contrast. What you see is God stretching out towards Adam. Every muscle is stretched out to Adam. God is going after Adam, pursuing Adam. And what you see Adam in reverse is Adam is just kind of laissez-faire, just like whatever. <laughs> He's reclining. Whatever. God is reaching for him. Adam is like, all right. And, and that picture is an explanation and a, and a depiction of our lives. That Christianity is not about our disciplined pursuit of God. Christianity is about God's disciplined pursuit of you. He's reaching for you. He comes for you. In the person of Jesus Christ, the word becomes flesh and dwells among us. And the last thing we need to hear about is that word us. Who is us? This is us. Oh, that's a good show, but this is us. We are sinners. We are rebellious. We do our own thing. And God comes to dwell with us. If we were just sinless and people who never made a mistake and didn't curse and didn't uh, do some crazy things while we were driving on Queens Boulevard today, we would say, of course God would want to dwell with us. But God dwells with people who are rebellious and sinners and we want to do our will and not his will. And yet God wants to be with us. It was Soren Kierkegaard, the great philosopher, who said that there is an infinite qualitative distinction between God and humanity. And yet, be, in spite of that infinite qualitative distinction between God and humanity, God can't get enough of you. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Here is the invitation of Christmas. Would you open up the home of your heart to receive him? He's here. He wants to dwell. But would you open up the home of your heart to receive him? Merry Christmas. Let's pray together. Let me invite you to close your eyes for a moment. The word became flesh and made his home among us to rescue us, forgive us, give life to us. This word would die on a cross for our sins, to do what we could not do for ourselves, to rescue us. He comes to dwell. And on this Christmas Eve, would you open the home of your heart to him? Lord Jesus, we confess that we have often not opened our hearts to you. And Lord, what an opportunity this Christmas Eve to open our hearts to you, maybe for the first time. For some of us who 
have never said yes to Jesus Christ, you've come to dwell among us, to give us life, Lord, would we open our hearts? For those of us who haven't, who maybe feel far from God, the Lord is drawing near to you. Would you open your heart to him? Would you come to him? Would you call on his name? And when we call on his name, he's here to rescue and forgive and pour out his grace. Lord, on this Christmas Eve, may we remember all the ways that you move close to us. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.